Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about how to solve basic definite integrals. And so we know from the fundamental theorem of calculus that if we have a definite integral of some function from a to b, that is equal to the antiderivative of that function evaluated from a to b. And this is calculated by plugging b into the antiderivative and then subtracting the value of a plugged into the antiderivative. And so for example, if we have the integral from 0 to 3 of 3x squared dx, we can solve this by first finding the antiderivative of 3x squared. And so if we use the power rule for integration, we'll have that that is equal to 3x to the third power divided by 3, and that will be evaluated from 0 to 3. Right, so all we did to use the power rule was to add 1 to our exponents. We have x to the third power, and then divide by that new exponent. And so then we can actually simplify this before we plug in our values of 3 and 0 by canceling out these 3s because 3 divided by 3 is equal to 1. And so we're actually going to have x cubed evaluated from 0 to 3. And so this will be equal to plugging 3 into x cubed. So we'll have 3 cubed minus the value of 0 plugged into x cubed. And so we'll have 0 cubed. And that's going to be equal to 27 minus 0. And so we just have 27. And this would be the answer to that definite integral. And so we can use this process thanks to the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate definite integrals. But if you notice when we found the antiderivative of 3x squared that I didn't add a plus c to the end of that answer. And there's a reason why I didn't do that. And so if we backtrack a little bit, if we said that the antiderivative was x cubed plus c, and that would be evaluated from 0 to 3, and so now watch what happens when we evaluate this. This will be equal to 3 cubed plus c minus 0 cubed plus c. And so if we simplify, this will be equal to 27 plus c, and it will distribute this negative to each part of this quantity, but this is just 0, so that doesn't matter. But we're still going to have a negative c, and so this will be minus c, and so these two c's will cancel out. And so once again, our answer is just 27. And so what we find here is that the constant of integration c is not necessary when evaluating definite integrals. We don't need to include it when we find the antiderivative of our function. All right, so now that you have seen the basic process of solving a definite integral, we will now move into talking about the properties of a definite integral. And so the first property that we're going to look at is this one right here, where if we have the integral from some bound to the same bound for a function, that's going to be equal to zero, right? So for example, if we had the integral from three to three of three x squared dx, that would be equal to zero, because if you were to go through that same process we went through earlier, where we integrated this function and then plugged in each of the bounds and subtracted, well, you would just be subtracting the same value because three evaluated on the antiderivative will be the same as this three evaluated on the antiderivative. And so it's just going to be zero. And so if you ever see an integral with the same bounds, it's just going to be equal to zero. And then our next property is if we have the integral from b to a for some function, that is going to be equal to the negative integral from a to b of that same function. And so what's happening here is if you have the integral from b to a of some function, but then you switch which bound is the lower bound and which bound is the upper bound, right? Notice that a is now the lower bound in this integral and b is now the upper bound in that integral. And so when you switch those bounds, if you put a negative in front of the integral, you will get the same answer. And so for example, we already found that the integral from zero to three of three x squared dx was equal to 27. That was that first example we looked at. And so if we wanted to find the integral from three to zero of that same function, three x squared and then dx, that would be equal to the negative integral from zero to three of three x squared dx, right? So we originally had zero to three of that function and now we're switching those bounds. Now zero is the upper limit and three is the lower limit. And so if we just negate this answer, we have our answer that this is just equal to negative 27. And so that would be the answer to that integral. And so you won't see this very often, but it is a nice property for definite integrals that you're going to want to know. All right, so our next property has to deal with constant multiples. And so if we have the integral from a to b of some constant k times a function and then dx, that's equal to that k times the integral from a to b of that function dx. Right, so what this is saying is if we have some constant times a function, we are allowed to pull out that constant to the front of the integral, and that will still give us the same answer. And so for example, if we had that same integral from zero to three of three x squared dx, 
we could pull out this three and we would have that this is equal to three times the integral from zero to three of x squared dx. And so let's go through and solve this integral and see if we still get the answer of 27 like we found earlier. And so this will be equal to three times and we're gonna have the antiderivative of x cubed divided by three, right? We added one to our exponent and then divided by that exponent. So we have x cubed divided by three and that will be evaluated from zero to three. And so then we'd have that this is equal to three times three plug into x cubed divided by three. So we'll have three cubed divided by three and then we'll subtract zero plugged into this function. So we will have zero cubed divided by three and that's going to be equal to three times three cubed, which is 27. So I have 27 divided by three. And then this term is just zero because zero cubed is zero. And then divided by three is still zero. And so we just have three times 27 thirds. And so these two threes will cancel out. And so this will just be equal to 27 once again. And so either way, whether we solved this without pulling out this three or we did pull out the three and then multiply it through later, we get the same answer. And so this is a nice property of definite integrals that you're also going to want to know. Our next property is a two for one. We have two properties in one property here. And that is if we have the integral from a to b of some function f of x plus or minus, so that means addition or subtraction of a second function g of x, that is equal to the integral from a to b, the same bounds of that first function f of x plus or minus, depending what it was over here, the integral from a to b, the same bounds of g of x, our second function. And so for example, if we had the integral from zero to three of three x squared plus eight dx, we could find the answer to this definite integral by splitting it up into two definite integrals, one for three x squared and another one for eight, because you can think of these two terms as being separate functions. And so this would be equal to the integral from zero to three of three x squared dx plus the integral from zero to three of eight dx. And that will give us the answer to this integral. And so we already know that this integral right here, this is the one we have been working with throughout this video, is equal to 27. But then let's evaluate this integral. We have eight dx from zero to three. The antiderivative of eight is going to be eight x. And so we'll evaluate that from zero to three. And so we'll have that this is equal to 27 plus eight times three minus eight times zero, right? We plugged three into here to get eight times three and plug zero in for x to have eight times zero. And of course we're subtracting that from eight times three. And so this will be equal to 27 plus eight times three, which is 24, and eight times zero is zero. And so we don't need to write zero. And then if we add 27 and 24, that will be equal to 51. And so that would be the answer to that integral. But then notice that this property would also work for subtraction between two functions. So if instead we had three X squared minus eight, then all we would do is change this plus sign here to be a minus. And that would slightly change our answer because now we'd have a minus here. And so we would be subtracting the evaluation of that second integral. And so we would have 27 minus 24, which is no longer 51, but is in fact just three. And so we'll have three. And that would be the answer if we had these functions being subtracted from each other instead of added. And so either way, whether it's plus or minus, you can use this property and split up a definite integral into two separate definite integrals for the two separate functions. And so you won't see this rule used explicitly in practice. Typically when solving an integral like this one right here, you're not going to want to take the time to split them up into two separate integrals. We kind of use the knowledge that this is true and instead we'll just have the following work we'll say that that integral is equal to the antiderivative of three X squared, which we said is X cubed, and then the antiderivative of negative eight, which will be minus eight X, and we would evaluate that from zero to three. And so we could plug three and zero into this whole function and still get the same answer of three, which you can see right here. We'll have that this is equal to three cubed minus eight times three minus zero cubed minus eight times zero. And that will be equal to 27 minus 24 minus zero. And that would still be equal to three. And so while this property is true and you can split up two functions inside an integral into two separate integrals, we sort of just skip that step and integrate both terms together and evaluate them on the bounds. All right, so you'll get the same answer either way. Let's look at one more final property regarding definite integrals. 
All right, so for our last property, we have the additive interval property. And so this property deals a little bit more explicitly with the idea that a definite integral represents the area under a curve or the area under the function you're integrating between the values of x that are your bounds, right? From your lower limit to your upper limit. And so let's say we had some function f of x right here, that's this line here, and we wanted to integrate it from a to b, which would be this value of x right here to this value of x right here. We could solve this definite integral or find the area under this function between those two points by splitting it up into two separate sections. We could find the area from A to some point C, which is between A and B, and then add the area from C to B, which is what these two integrals right here represent. This purple integral represents this purple area, right? We're finding the area under the function from A to C, which would be right here, and then our green integral here is finding the area under the function from C to B, which would be right here. And so the whole idea of this property is that you are able to split up an area that you are trying to find into two separate regions and you can add them together to get that same area. And so you might be wondering, well, why is this ever useful? Why wouldn't we just take the integral from A to B for that function? Why would we ever want to add two separate parts together? And the answer to that question will be found in our next example here. So let's take a look. All right, so here's our example. We have the integral from negative one to one of the absolute value of x. And so now maybe it's starting to click for you here. We don't know how to take the integral of the absolute value of x. That's just not a function that we have an integral rule for. And so instead, we're going to have to resort to what we know about the absolute value function. And so here's the graph of the function. And remember that the definite integral here is calculating the area from negative one to one underneath this function. And so the area from negative one to one would be this area that I'm shading in right now. And so what we can do to solve this integral is split it up into two separate integrals to calculate the area under this part of the function and then calculate the area under this part of the function, treating these two lines as separate functions, right? This line right here, although it's part of this function, which is the absolute value of x, this could also be written as negative x, right? This line up until x equals zero is the line negative x. And then this line right here from zero and onward is the function positive x. And so we can split up this integral into two separate integrals. We'll have one that goes from negative one to zero of negative x dx, and then we'll add this to the integral from zero to one of positive x dx, right? And so this first integral here represents the area from negative one to zero, this triangle area right here. And we chose the function negative x because that is what this line would be from all the negative values to zero. Another way to think about this is we just took what was in our absolute value bars and negated it for the first half of our function. And then for the second half, we just kept it as it is, but without the absolute value bars. And so then we just have the integral from zero to one, which is where that function would take place. And so if you're working with a much more complicated absolute value function, all you have to do is set what is in between the absolute value bars equal to zero and that will tell you the point where your function is changing or the point between your two bounds where you are going to want to split up your integral into two separate integrals. So for example, if we were to set what was inside our absolute value bars here equal to zero, we would just have x equals zero. So there's no solving to do there, but that would tell us that x equals zero is going to be that middle bound that we are going to use to split up the integral of this function between these two bounds. So notice we have negative one to zero and then from zero to one and negative one was our lower bound over here, and one was our upper bound over there. And so if we were to solve these two integrals to find the answer to this definite integral, this would be equal to the antiderivative of negative x, which is going to be negative x squared divided by two. If we use the power rule, we add one to our exponent, so one plus one is two, and then divide by that new exponent, two, and that will be evaluated from negative one to zero. And then we're going to add the integral of x, which is going to be x squared divided by two, using that same process of the power rule, and that will be evaluated from zero to one. And so then we'll have that this is equal to zero plugged into this function. So we'll have negative zero squared divided by two minus, and then we'll plug negative one into this function. And so then we'll have negative, negative one squared divided by two, and then we'll close that up, and then we will add one plugged into this function, so we'll have one squared divided by two minus zero plugged into this function, and so we'll have zero squared divided by two. And so if we simplify, this will be equal 
to 0 squared divided by 2. So that's just going to be 0 right here. So we don't need to worry about that term. But then here, these two negatives will become a positive, And so we're just going to have negative 1 squared, which is 1 divided by 2. So it's just going to be positive 1 half. And then we're going to add 1 squared divided by 2. So that's just another half. And then, of course, 0 squared divided by 2 is 0. And so we don't need to worry about that term either. And so we just have 1 half plus 1 half, which is equal to 1. And so that is the answer to this definite integral. This is the area underneath the absolute value of x from negative 1 to 1. And so now that you have seen the additive interval property in action, you have seen an example for all the different properties of definite integrals that we're going to look at in this video. But before we end this lesson, let's look at one more example of solving a definite integral. All right, so here's our example. We have the integral from 1 to 3 of 6x squared plus 5x minus 4 dx. And so while we could use our addition and subtraction rule and split this up into three separate integrals, it's not necessary to do. And so instead, we can just skip right to the step where we take the integral of each of these functions and add them together. And so we'll start by taking the integral of 6x squared, and that's going to be 6 times x to the third power divided by 3. Right, we add 1 to 2 and then divide by that new exponent, 3. And then we'll add this to the integral of 5x. And that's going to be equal to 5 times x squared divided by 2. Right, we added 1 to the exponent here to get x squared. And then divided by that new exponent of 2. And then we will subtract the integral of 4, which is just going to be 4x. Anytime you take the integral of a constant, you just multiply it by the variable that you were taking an integral with respect to. In this case, we were integrating with respect to x. That's what dx tells us. And so we'll just multiply 4 by x. And then we're going to evaluate this from 1 to 3. But before we evaluate it on our bounds, let's simplify this a little bit. We know that 6 divided by 3 is 2. And so this will be equal to 2x cubed plus, and then we'll have 5 halves times x squared. So we'll have 5 divided by 2 times x squared and then minus 4x, and we're still evaluating from 1 to 3. But now if we plug 3 into this function, we'll have that this is equal to 2 times 3 cubed plus 5 halves times 3 squared minus 4 times 3. And then we'll subtract plugging 1 into all of these terms. And remember to put parentheses around all of these, because if you don't, you might forget to distribute this negative to each term that you are plugging 1 into. And that's important that you subtract all of those terms and not just the first one, because otherwise you're going to get an incorrect answer. But if we plug 1 into this function, we'll have 2 times 1 cubed plus 5 halves times 1 squared minus 4 times 1. And so if we go through and simplify this, this will be equal to 2 times 27, 3 cubed is 27, plus 5 halves times 9, because 3 squared is 9, minus 12, and then minus, and we're going to distribute this negative to each term here as we go along. We'll have negative 2, because 1 cubed is 1, so 2 times 1 is 2, and then we're going to have minus, right, distribute this negative to this term, so it was positive, but now it's negative, 5 halves, because 1 squared is just 1, so we have 5 halves, and then we are going to add 4, because it's negative, but we're negating it, and so we'll have plus 4. And so if we clean up our work a little bit here, this will be equal to 54 plus 45 halves minus 14 minus 5 halves plus 4. And so if we add our whole numbers together here, we'll have 54 minus 14, which would be 40, plus 4, so we'd have 44, so this is equal to 44, and then we're going to add up our fractions, and notice that they have the same denominator, so we can just add their numerators, which is 45 and negative 5, and so that means we'll have plus 40 halves, which is equal to 44 plus 20, because 40 divided by 2 is 20, and that will be equal to 64, and that would be the final answer to this definite integral. And with that, that's all I had for this lesson on how to solve definite integrals. And so if you want to see some more examples, including more difficult examples, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.